chapter 3. While you're turning there, I'd just like to remind you a couple uh, of nights ago I uh, brought out this sheet that uh, uh, brought a message based on the on this sheet. It's uh, uh, my goals for 2013. My goals for 2013 and it just has nine different uh, goals that uh, are important uh, for those of us who are children of God, those of us who are saved. Now, if you're not saved, if you're not a child of God, these probably mean nothing to you. But these are some things that we uh, should do. I'm not talking about making a New Year's resolution. New Year's resolutions are made to be broken. Uh, most of the ones that I've ever made uh, have uh, uh, never uh, made it uh, past the first month. But when I've made a determination, when I've gone to the Lord and I've said, Lord, these are the things that I will accomplish for you, I will guarantee you every, uh, every year that uh, I've put these down, every year that I've set a goal, uh, I may not have reached every single one of them to the fullest extent uh, that I felt like I should have, but I've always accomplished something. Someone says, if you aim at nothing, you'll hit it every time. And so if you have nothing to aim at, uh, you have nothing to accomplish. But if you have a goal, you set aside, hey, this is what I, I need to do for, uh, for my spirituality. We're not talking about uh, somebody else's spirituality, but for yourself. What is it? Uh, it's talking about prayer, Bible reading, Bible study, uh, church attendance, tithing, service, spirit, uh, being filled with the Spirit, a transformed life, thankful heart, uh, and soul winning. Uh, those nine things right there, if you will make a determination. Now, there's a copy of this paper. Uh, most of everybody that was here on that, that evening that I, I uh, brought this message uh, uh, took one of these. Some of them took one for themselves and uh, one for their wives or uh, one for their family, other family member, whatever. Uh, but they're laying on the table in the foyer, and uh, you're welcome to get one. Uh, tomorrow is New Year's Eve. Uh, Tuesday is New Year's Day. And that would be a good time uh, to set these goals to start determine. This is what I'm going to do for God in 2013. Like I said, if you don't set any goals, you're not going to do anything. You're going to finish 2013 just like you finished 2012. Are you further along in 2012 than when you started uh, 2012 would be the question that I'd like to ask. And then take that paper and say, what can I do to improve? Now, like I said, if you will do something and make a goal and ask the Lord to help you and, and focus on that every single day, I guarantee you, you're going to do more in 2013 than you did in 2012. I invite you to stand with me in the reverence of reading of the Word of God, 1 Corinthians chapter number 3. 1 Corinthians chapter number 3. I'm going to read the first 15 verses and pull my text out of verse number 11 uh, this morning. 1 Corinthians chapter number 3. Verse number 1, or chapter number 3, verse number 1 says, And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual... But as, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk and not with meat, for hitherto you were not able to bear it, neither yet now are you able. Fear yet carnal, for whereas there is among you envy and strife and divisions, are you not carnal and walk as men? For while one saith, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are ye not carnal? Who then is Paul? And who is Apollos? But ministers by whom ye believe, even as the Lord gave to every man. I have planted Apollos water, but God gave the increase. So then neither is he that planteth nor anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. Now we have he that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every man that received his own reward according to his own labor. For we are laborers together with God. Ye are our husbandry, ye are God's building. According to the grace of God, which is given unto me, as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Christ Jesus Christ. Now if any man build upon this foundation, 
gold, silver, precious stones, and wood, hay, uh, stubble. Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall be he receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. But he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. I said I want to pull my text from verse number 11 this morning. And if you'll look at that verse, notice what he says. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Foundation is Jesus Christ. The foundation is Jesus Christ. I want to speak to you briefly this morning on the subject, building on a sure foundation. Let's pray. Father, as we bow before you this morning, Lord, we are, are human, and we are here this morning seeking, Lord, work, uh, uh, inspiration from your word, encouragement from your word this morning. Lord, this is the last Sunday of, uh, uh, of the year that we have uh, just come through. Many of us have seen uh, success, we've seen failure, we've seen uh, things happen that we wish had never happened, we've seen things that uh, were accomplished that we're thankful for, we've seen uh, uh, the, the birth of, uh, of children, we've seen the passing of those whom we love. Lord, all of these things have been a part of our, our daily lives. And so, Father, I pray this morning that as we embark upon a new year, as we get ready to launch uh, into a uh, into a clean slate, into a, a year that has not yet been lived, into a day that has not been uh, uh, etched upon yet. Lord, I pray that you'd help us to, to build on the foundation of Jesus Christ this year. Help us, Lord, to look, Lord, for things in our own life that would help us to build on that right foundation. Give us the strength that we need, for it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. As we uh, gone through uh, 2012, there were three times that I personally remember uh, that uh, we have looked for doom and gloom or destruction. Uh, remember, on May the 21st of 2012, uh, Harold Campings had, uh, uh, had promoted that the rapture was going to take place and everybody was going to be raptured out and, and uh, this world was going to go be uh, launched into a, a destructive cycle of the uh, tribulation period of time. And, uh, and so everybody waited with bated breath. Those of us who were fundamentalists that believed the Bible uh, knew that he was uh, uh, a little off of his rocker. We, we knew that, <laughs> that he had uh, uh, forecast these, uh, these uh, uh, raptures to take place in previous years and had uh, missed the mark every single time. And, of course, I reminded uh, our congregation on the following Sunday that uh, Harold Campings uh, was an idiot, but not in those words, but uh, try to be kind about it. But uh, why, why did Harold Campings make a mistake? Because we do not know the day nor the hour. Matthew 26, uh, uh, or 2530 uh, says, No man knows the day nor the hour that our Lord doth come. No man knows that time. But we waited for that, and we make joke about it, and we, we make quips about it, and we, we read different uh, uh, little anecdotes and things all about that. And we waited for May the 21st, and of course it came and went, and we were still here. And then, of course, uh, Harold Campings wouldn't let that lie. Uh, he said, oh, I, I missed it. I, I made a mistake and uh, began to just really pervert uh, the Word of God and say it was October the 21st. October the 21st is D-Day. That is the day. And uh, the 21st of May was when the rapture literally took place. Those that uh, were left, now there's no chance that anybody else could be saved. And if he even quit uh, uh, televising any kind of gospel message on, the, on his radio program. Uh, all he would play was his gospel music and what have you. And uh, of course, October 21st came and went, and we're still here. And then, of course, everybody got all up in arms about the Mayan calendar and the ending of the uh, of uh, 2012 and, and what all of those ramifications were and what happened and the Mayans had to know. <laughs> Somebody posted, I think, on Facebook or the uh, Internet somewhere and said, you know, uh, if the Mayans knew when it was going to end, you know, they, they, they ended a whole lot longer or a lot sooner uh, than their calendar ended. There's no Mayans. <coughs> And so anyway, uh, but we waited for December the 21st, and of course, we're still here. Well, what does that tell us? Well, number one, it tells us that we don't know the day nor the hour. 
It, it tells us that no man can, can clue him as to a specific time. Jesus said he didn't even know the specific time that the Lord would come. The angels in heaven don't know. Jesus himself doesn't know. That's reserved uh, in, in the very mindset of God uh, to send uh, forth his son Jesus Christ to rapture the church. That's in God's mind. It has nothing to do with what we could do. We could sit there and figure out, and we could go through numerologies, and we could go through uh, what happened, and, you know, this happened in a 6,000-year period of time, and <clears throat> this happened in a 2,000-year period of time, and this happened in 7,000 years, and, and, and all these things, and, and we could try to figure it all out, but why? Amen. But why? It's just a waste of energy. It's a waste of time when the thing that we are supposed to be focused on is serving God. Amen. The thing that we are supposed to be serve, focused on is doing what God has asked us to do. The thing that we are to be focused on is reading the Word of God and determining from the Word of God what is my responsibility and what is your responsibility in, in, in bringing a lost and dying nation to the Lord Jesus Christ. That should be our focus. But we've lost focus in everything. As I was thinking about this message, I thought about, uh, I had some questions that came up. If the Lord had come on May the 21st, or October the 21st, or December the 21st, and you met the Lord face to face, would you have been happy? Well, the inclination for those of us who are saying, oh yeah, we'd be excited, we'd be in heaven, and, uh, and, and we'd be thrilled about the fact that, that we're out of this miserable life, and out of this miserable body, and, and out of this miserable uh, economic climate, and this political situation we're in, and all of this. Man, we would be thrilled. But would you? When you were face to face with God, you see, I, I don't think that we uh, have the right ad idea about this. I don't think we have the right attitude about this. Yes, we would be removed from this world, but there is a coming judgment for those of us who are saved. It's called the Bema Seat Judgment. It's the, the, not the white throne judgment that he talks about in Revelation chapter number 20, where those who are unsaved are going to be judged by God. Uh, they're they're going to be judged by their works according to to their works, and then uh, they'll turn to the second book, the book of life. Their name is not written there. And Jesus will say, depart from me, a worker of iniquity. I never knew you. <coughs> and so there's the, uh, the, the white throne judgment. But those of us that are saved are going to go through a what is called the FEMA seat judgment. This is the, a judgment where uh, we, we will receive the awards for the service that we have given to God. It's, a, it's going to take place in heaven. While the tribulation period of time is going here on the earth, those of us who are saved and will be raptured out will go through this beam of seat judgment. Now, it's not a judgment for our sin because our sin has already been judged. Our sin was judged and we, we, uh, we dealt with that judgment by receiving Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of our life. Jesus paid the penalty for our sin on the cross of Calvary. That part is taken care of. It, we, we will never be judged for our sin because of the death, the burial, and the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. However, according to 1 Corinthians chapter number 3, we will be uh, stand before God and we give an account of what we have done in this body since we've been saved. Think about that. Notice that in, in the word of God that we will stand and we will be bring to him the, what we have built upon in our Christian life. Our gold, our silver, our precious stones, our wood, our hay, our stone, everything is going to be brought before God, not our sin, but our actions, our motivations, the things that we've done since we've been saved. Those times that we stayed home, let me kind of break it down to the level. The times that we stayed home when we should have been in the house of God. Amen. What was our motivation for staying home? Was it to play Angry Birds because I was so addicted to that that all I could do is sit there on my phone or on my iPad or on my computer and play Angry Birds, whatever that is. I don't know what Angry Birds are, but I've heard people stay home because of it. 
or because a, 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 a certain uh, uh, team is playing on, on TV. The Texans are playing this afternoon. They'll be done by the time the church comes tonight. They only win in the last few seconds of the game anyway. Watch the Texas game over at Brother Bobby's. Watch the Texas game at Brother Bobby's last night. We had to watch it because there was no sound. It was just muted. You know. And when I left, the, 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 the Texas was behind. I didn't find out until this morning that, they, that Texas actually won the game. The only thing that would made it better is if they have been playing LSU. <laughs> and LSU. <coughs> now the truth is that what we do, what, what, our, what our motivations are, is what's going to be judged by God at the Bema Seat Judgment. And notice there are several things here. First of all, notice what I, what I put uh, as our text here is verse number 11. For other foundation can no man lay that that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Those of us who are saved, our foundation, everything we do, our motivation, our life, our everything is placed upon one person, and that person is Jesus Christ. He is the foundation. If he is not the foundation of your Christian life, then something is wrong in your Christian life. Right. Amen. You see, there's a lot of churches that preach in, uh, in, in a work salvation. I'm not preaching a work salvation. You are saved by faith in Jesus Christ and Him alone. It is by the grace of God that you are saved. Amen. Now, after we are saved, we like to quote uh, uh, Ephesians 2, 8, 9, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And we stop right there, and we say we're saved by grace, and, and it's not by works, and we stop right there and say, Now I have to do nothing. You're saved, you're right. May I go to the next verse? Verse number 10, which says, We are his workmanship in Christ Jesus unto good works. Amen. Once you are saved, I mean, you're not saved to warm 18 inches of pew. You're not warm to, uh, to uh, saved just to, uh, to, to exist in this life until the rapture takes place. If there was nothing else left for you to do, if there was no other uh, motive for God to save you, then he would take you to heaven immediately at, your, at the point of your salvation. But he doesn't do that. He leaves us here to do his work. He leaves us here to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He leaves us here to be a catalyst. He leaves us here to, to, to influence this world. Man. How are we doing in that, by the way? Not too well. We're not living up to it too well. Our, our world is collapsing in on us, and, and we're seeing our, our, our liberties, and we're seeing our freedom in America being, being taken away from us uh, continuously. I hope you will support Hobby Lobby. You say, why should I support Hobby Lobby? Because it's a Christian company. It's, it's, a, it's a company that was established on Christian principles and Christian uh, ideals. And it is... Uh, been a good company. They, they close on Sunday. They let their employees go to work, go, go to church uh, on Sunday. Now, according to the Obamacare and, and all of that, uh, the, the, the company is going to have to support uh, and have to provide uh, abortion and, uh, and uh, uh, the morning after pill and those types of things within the, uh, the confines of, its, uh, uh, of insurance that Obamacare says that you will have to do. This is a mandate. You will have to do this. Catholic churches all across America have said, no, you cannot do this. This is a mandating what, what you think is morally right. And we morally disgust it. We, don't, we think it's wrong. You cannot do that. Hobby Lobby stood up and said, we will not. We will not provide that care within the confines of Obamacare. We will not do that. We will not provide that. We will not pay for it. We will not put it out to our employees as a part, a part of our health care. They took it to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court says, yes, you will. They said, okay, we'll pay the $1.3 million a day. Not a year. 
a day for violating a principle or for, for supporting a principle that, that violates our stand for Christ and for the Word of God. They're willing to pay a $1.3 million a day fine saying, we will not do it. That is called civil disobedience. That is exactly what Paul and Silas and those in the in book of Acts did when they were following uh, God. And they said, you cannot preach in that name. They said, we will preach in that name. Amen. You cannot speak like that. We will speak like that. We will pro preach and stand upon the principles of the word of God. And I will guarantee you in the next 20 years, the Lord tarry his coming, you will see a dividing and a division among Christianity in, in, in America when people begin to fall prey to the world and say, when they start making mandates that you can't preach against homosexuality and you can't preach against abortion and you can't preach against the things that the Bible calls sin and wickedness. You can't do that or you will be uh, charged, you'll be fined, you'll be in prison. I will guarantee you there will be a, a line drawn in the sand by the fundamentalists uh, of those who stand on the truth of the principles of the word of God and said, we will not bow, we will not bend, and we will not capitulate. You see, that's coming, folks. You said that will never happen in America. Yeah. Neither would prayer be kicked out of schools. Neither would the Bible be kicked out of school. Right. Neither would the Ten Commandments be kicked off the walls of our courthouses. Yeah. Just keep telling me what will never happen. Because I will guarantee you it will happen. And there is a line already being drawn in the sand. There is a, 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 a mandate between the uh, Obama administration and fundamental Christians who will stand for the right and do the right thing. They are saying, we will put you down. We will, put you, we will silence you. We will make sure that your voice is not heard. <clears throat> you say, oh, we have freedom of speech. How's that working for you? Yeah. Yeah. How's that working? Now, there's several things here I want you to see. Number one, first of all, I want, to, I want you to see that every man shall receive his own reward. Look, if you will, at verse number eight. Now, he that planteth and he that watereth is, are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. Folks, your reward is not coming based upon what I tell you to do. It's on your own labor. Right. You're going to stand before God face to face according to what you have done in your life. Not according to what I have done. I'm going to stand before God for what I preached. I'm going to stand before God of what I taught. See, I have a higher responsibility because of being a pastor of a church. I'm going to stand before God and give an account for every message that I preach, for everything that I utter, whether it be true, whether it be right, whether it be for my own glory, for my own honor, for whatever. God, I will stand before God a part of that, but you will stand before God individually for what you've done in all of your work and all of your labor. Notice that. What foundation are you building on? Are you building on Jesus Christ? Is the labor that you're working, the work that you're doing, is it built upon the purpose of, of, of uh, promoting and encouraging the things of God? Or is it encouraging and promoting yourself? That's what the judgment's going to be. That's where you're going to stand. You're going to stand before God, and he's going to ask you some very tough questions. And you're going to have to give a very detailed answer as to what you believe. Sometimes the kids at school get in trouble and they, they bring them into the office and, and you sit them down across from you and you say, now, son, did you do this? I don't know. Why'd you do that? I don't know. I always tell them, I don't know is not an answer. I don't know is not an answer because you know why you did it. It didn't just happen. You didn't just 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 all of a sudden, just do it. You had to think about it. You had to premeditate. You had to think upon these things. 
And you have to make a decision. What are you going to do? How are you going to do it? Everything, every, everything you do, every man, every boy, every girl, every man, every woman is going to stand before God in, in his life and give an account. Notice that. He says, for we are laborers together with God. You see, you and I are laborers together. My responsibility is to motivate you to get up and get out and do something. But that's all I can do is motivate. I can't come to your house and drag you out of bed. I can't come to your house and, 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 with, uh, and, and force you uh, to go out soul winning. I can't come to your house and force you to read your Bible. I can't come to your house and force you to pray. You've got to do that all on your own. That's why I put out that list. Here's nine things that we should do in, 20, in 2013 that will help us live for God. Help us to build on that right foundation. What is the foundation? Jesus Christ. Let's do everything for Him. Amen. He says every man is going to stand before God. We're going to receive for the labor that we've done. Notice, if you will, uh, secondly, verse number 10. That every man take heed how he buildeth thereon. Look at verse 10. According to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereon. How are you going to build on that foundation? What, 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 what are you going to put on that foundation? Is that foundation going to last? Is it going to endure the storms of life? Remember, Jesus told the story in Matthew chapter 7. He said, the wise man built his house upon the rock. And the storms came, the floods came, and, and descended, and, and the house stood firm. Why? Because it was building upon the rock. The foolish man built his house on the sand. Two different foundations, a, a, a solid foundation or a weak and, and, and floundering foundation. In the one that built his house on the sand, the floods came, the, the, the rains descended, the winds blew, and the, and the foundation was destroyed and the house became, became not one because it wasn't built on the right foundation. What foundation are you building on? When you go to the doctor next year and the doctor says, I'm sorry to tell you, but you have terminal cancer and you're going to die. What foundation are you going to have to stand on when, when you get that news? When, 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 the, when, when the, the, the police officer comes to your door and knocks on the door and says, you, you have, uh, your child has been arrested and, and, and charged with murder. What foundation are you going to have to build upon? You see, your foundation is what is, is going to stand you and support you in the time of your trouble, in the time of your difficulty. Too many of us flippantly say, well, you know how God is. Yeah, I know how God is. He's an austere God. He's a God of judgment. But He's also a loving and compassionate God. We need to understand that God loves us and God, but He also wants us to serve Him. He wants us to honor Him. He wants us to give Him of our lives. And the only foundation that we have is Jesus Christ. How many times have I gone to the funeral home and, and, and watched a family that has, that, have, that has no God? They have a, a semblance of religiosity. They believe in God. But they've never served God. And I've sat down at the table uh, there uh, to make the arrangements with the family who, who has a loved one who's died and by all indications has gone to hell because they have no hope. <coughs> they never attend a church. And attending church doesn't get you into heaven no more than getting going into a garage makeshift car. They, they, they don't read the Bible. They don't have a favorite verse that can be pulled out. They, they never prayed. They never did anything uh, as far as that. But they believed in God. I believe in George Washington too. 
I believe that when I go leave from the service this morning, this morning I'm going to go get in my truck and I'm going to put the key in and I'm going to hit the starter and it's going to start. I believe that. But if that's the only belief I have for this life, I'm of all men most miserable. I have no hope. I have no foundation. I have nothing. At that funeral service, those people will try to pull that body out of that casket because they cannot bear to see the closing of that casket on a life. <coughs> you see, there's a difference there. I've been to a funeral service where, where there's been a loved one that's loved God and served God and honored God. I mean, they can sit there and tell you all kinds of stories of how God has been an integral part of their lives. And there's hope and there's joy and there's peace to come. You see, there, there, there's, there's the there's foundation. Where is your foundation? If your foundation is in a, in a Sunday morning religion, then you've lost your foundation somewhere. If, you're, if your foundation is in just a, a, a date, a time, somewhere in the past that has not changed your heart, has not changed your life, has not motivated you into service for God, something is wrong. Something is wrong. When you can absent yourself from the house of God, and you can absent yourself from reading the word of God, and you can absent yourself from prayer, and you can absent yourself from, from training and teaching your children to do the right things and to follow the right path, something is ter drastically, terribly wrong in a Christian's life who does not love God and who does not desire to see God to be the first and foremost thing in their lives. Where is your foundation? Every man's building, every man's labor, every man's work, he says. Notice, if you will, verse number 13. Every man's work shall be made manifest for the day. Everything's going to be seen for what it really is. Manifest, shown up. It's going to appear for exactly what it is. What is the motivation for you serving God? What is the motivation for you uh, uh, coming to the house of God? What is the motivation for your giving? What is the motivation for your giving out tracts? What is the motivation? Is it for personal pride and, and personal uh, uh, recognition? If that's what it's for, it ain't going to last. You ever heard the, the, the saying, flattery gets you nowhere? <clears throat> you know, some people, they, they can make you sound like really good. They can pat you on the back, and they can stroke your ego. And we say, well, I don't, I don't like flattery. Everybody likes their ego stroked. Everybody likes that. We all like to hear, boy, good job. But if that is your motivation, is to get the praise of men, you've lost it. You've lost it. You see, the problem in our society is that we, we like the attaboys, and we like the praise, and we like all of that. But he said every man's work is going to be manifest for what it is. For the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire. And the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. In the previous verse, he talks about the, uh, about the works. Gold, silver, precious stone, wood, hay, and stubble. Which one, of, what, what, which one of those commodities that he's listed there are going to endure the fires uh, of the trial and the test? You say, well, the gold, silver, and the precious stone, those are going to endure. See, fire purifies gold. And fire purifies silver. And fire purifies the, the, the precious stones. They, they make them better. They enhance them. And so the trials of our faith that Peter talks about in 1 Peter, he says, he says the trials of our faith... If you get into a little difficulty in your Christian life and you give up, you didn't endure too good. Your foundation wasn't very strong. Amen. 
That's what happens all across. You will see, if you go back uh, uh, six months, you say, well, where's so-and-so? Where's so-and-so? Where's so-and-so? I'll guarantee you the trials of their faith cause them to jump ship. Because every single one of us are going to have trials and tests and difficulties. It's a part of our life. God didn't promise us a rose garden. And if he did, as, as Brother Bobby said yesterday, that, that, that rose garden is going to have thorns in it. Those rose bushes out there that we have uh, 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 across our property, uh, so close to, somewhere between 300 and 350 uh, rose bushes out there, every single rose bush out there has thorns on it. They're very beautiful. I'm Brad, Brother Priest and Brother Lee go out there and trim them and, and get them all up because they get all the thorns. I, like, I enjoy the beauty of it, but they, they enjoy the, they get the labor of it. They get the thorns. They get the, uh, the, 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 the sweat of the brow to, to, to clean them up and to straighten them up and to, and to make them look as beautiful as they are. Most of us are content to look at them, but we don't want the labor involved. And that's how most of us are in our Christian life. We want to see the beauty of it, but we don't want to see the labor of it. We don't, we don't want to endure the, the hardships. We don't want to en endure somebody making fun of us or somebody uh, 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 saying something derogatory to us because we gave them a gospel tract. We don't, want, we don't want that part of it. No, that's part of the wood fire. That's the, the part of the gold and the silver and the precious stones. Keeping on going when everybody else makes fun of you. I have a friend of mine whose mother told them, you don't want to get too fanatical about this religious stuff. You don't have to go to church all the time. <laughs> what am I supposed to do? We're saying not the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of something. That's a, that's a command from the word of God. They called me and said, you know, this is what my mother said. I'm saying, you know, well, I'm sorry your mother feels that way, but you ought to serve God anyway. How come you can't come to our, our, our family union because you're serving alcohol? Well, what's a little alcohol? The back it tells me that there's a sin against providing alcohol to my neighbors. <gasps> You're calling us wicked sinners because we have alcohol? Just say it. That's what the Bible says. I'm not yeah. saying that. I got to miss church on Sunday. But don't you love us? Yeah, I love you. Can't we do this on Saturday? Why do we have to do it during church time? Why do we have to? Because that's when everybody else has time. So you take God's time rather than using your own time. You see, wood, hay, stone. See, all of that, you're going to stand before God with one of that, that one of these days. And you're going to go, well, God, you know, my mommy said that, that because uh, I, I, I wasn't a part of the family because I, I wouldn't come and they were selling alcohol or serving alcohol. And, and so it's my mommy's fault. It's really not my fault, God. It's just, it's just her fault. I just, yeah, that's gone. Or not. Because those are excuses that we use. But when you endure that, because I guarantee you one of these days, that same mama that told that, that child, don't go be too fanatical, is going to call that child and say, hey, I need prayer. Amen. Yeah. You, you don't call people who you know don't pray to pray for you. You call the people that you know are going to get in contact right. with God. Amen. You see, don't, don't, don't let them shame you into doing what is wrong because you know to do what's wrong. Amen. You're going to stand before God. Where is your foundation? Your foundation ought to be in God. Amen. 
in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the foundation. And everything else is built upon that. And if you build that with the strong, the gold, the silver, the precious stone, I will guarantee you it will, it, it will endure the storms of life and the trials and the tests. But when you see it all burn up, you know it didn't last. Continuing on, notice what he says in verse 13. The fire shall try every man's work according to what sort it is. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. But Brother Lamb, you say that if I just serve God, that, that I'm going to get a reward, and I should do it for the reward's sake? You know, I really don't know people that are serving God that are really looking for a reward. I really don't. Most, most men of God that I've seen serving God and, and giving their life and hazarding their life for the gospel's sake are doing it because of love. Not constraint. Not because I have to, but because I want to. See, there's a difference. When you have when you when you're out in the in the middle of the of the ocean or the lake and you're drowning, <clears throat> and there's no hope, and you've gone down for the third time. You resign yourself to death. And somebody reaches down and, and, and lifts you out of that water and puts you in the safety of a boat and administers CPR and brings you back to life. What is your attitude towards that individual? What is your attitude? You're faithful, aren't you? I mean, you, 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 you want to... You, you want to give them a Christmas gift at Christmas time. And you want to send them a, a Valentine's gift. And you want to send them a, a Thanksgiving gift. And, and you just want to call them and thank them for saving your life every single day. Why is it that we would thank somebody, some human being, for saving our life when, when, when Jesus Christ lifted us up out of the miry clay and set our feet on a rock and established our going, put a new song in our and praise into our God? Why would we want to do anything but praise Him? And honor him and serve him. Amen. We treat him like last week's news. Yeah. We treat him like nothing at all. Somebody says, Well, if you were to die today, you're going, Oh, yeah, I'm going to heaven. Really? Really? How is it? And Paul puts it into perspective that I'm dealing with you as babies, as children. I can't, I can't feed you the spiritual meat, the, the strengthening sustenance that you need because you're still relying on the, on the, on the baby food. Under the milk, and, and, and I, can't, I can't raise you up to that level that you need to be because your foundation is not in the right place. Your foundation ought to be in Christ Jesus. Building on the right, sure foundation. What foundation are you building on? We built this building. If I'm not mistaken, there's 38 eight-foot piers underneath this building. 38 of them. There's a four-foot beam, concrete beam, that runs all the way around the perimeter and through the center and, and, and section this building off that's sitting up on those piers, holding this foundation sure. This foundation's not going anywhere. <coughs> You say, well, if there's an earthquake, it's going to move. Yeah, it might move if there's an earthquake. I think the building might move, but I don't know if the foundation is going to go anywhere. Before they put the carpet down and before I, they, they, they uh, uh, put the tile down, 
You walk across this, and, and there'll be little fissures, little little pieces, little, little like little cracks all through the. You go, oh. It's cracked. <clears throat> now those are stress cracks. They're just little fissures. They're, I mean, they're not. You can't even. You can see them in the cement, but you can't really feel them. That don't change the strength of this foundation. And the fact that Jesus Christ died on the cross of Calvary does not change the strength of the foundation. It only enhances it. It only builds upon it. You see, because the fires of hell could not quench the salvation that was bought on the cross of Calvary by Jesus Christ. So, that foundation is strong. Let's stay on that foundation. Let's make sure that it doesn't wash away. Let's make sure that, it, that, that it's gonna, gonna stand. When we built this building, they, they, they made us raise it up, I believe it was nine inches. It was already above Garth Road. They were afraid of flooding. I said, we're gonna be the church on the hill. It's the only hill in Baytown. But they made us raise it nine inches so that, but they're going to come up in, in, the, next, in the next year, so they're going to come and they're going to widen Garth Road out to four lanes or five lanes. Praise God. And they're going to cut it down like they did down here on the other side of Wallaceville. They're going to cut it down three feet. So we're really going to be on the hill. What was the purpose of, of, of they said, in case it floods? We are not even in a floodplain. Mr. Burnside said, my daddy built the, house, the homestead here where, 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 where this church sits because of a, it was a, a rice farm. We couldn't get water up here. If you can't get water to a rice field, it's useless. So build a house there because you're not going to get water there to get flooded. But if we say four foot, which is possible. And the water came rushing in. I guarantee you this foundation is not going anywhere. Because it's built on a sure foundation. And I don't care what Obama does. I don't care what Pelosi does. I don't care what Holder or any of the rest of them do. God's foundation is sure. You can rest on him. Build on that foundation. And you'll never be sorry. Let's stand for prayer. Father, we thank you for you. For your blessing. And I pray, Father, you'd help us, Lord, to realize, Lord, that in, in these closing days of, uh, of 2012, we may not have accomplished everything that we wanted to accomplish for you, Lord. But we accomplished a few things. We saw souls saved. We saw lives changed. Or we saw folks baptized and raised to walk in newness of life. Father, we saw some, uh, some, some trials, we saw some tests, we saw some burdens. But Lord, we know that we're on the right foundation. We're building <coughs> on a firm foundation, Christ Jesus. As we embark upon 2013, Lord, I pray that you would help us to maintain and continuously build on that foundation. Help us to grow spiritually. Help us to grow numerically. And help us to grow, Lord, in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Father, speak to our hearts. It's our prayer in Jesus' name. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed. No one looking around.